Amen. So as members of the body of Christ, we are assigned different gifts to press us to function as one fit, healthy body. And so my preaching idea is this. Christ does a body good. I, yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> so keep your, your Bible open to that passage, and, um, and I'll be doing a, a series on that passage, part one today and part two next week. So whatever I miss today, I'll catch it up next week. All right? So we're looking at the book of Romans, the book of Romans. Paul wrote this letter to this church that he did not start. And he'd never visit it. But he wrote this letter, and I, you know we get some good information from the book of Romans. What was going on was the church was started and founded by people that were at the Pentecost. So the church consisted of Christian Gentiles and Christian Jews. But during this time, the Jews had been dispelled from Rome possibly for preaching that Jesus is Lord. And if you know anything about the Roman Empire, the, 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 their, their Caesar, their emperor, or whatever was deemed Lord. And so they, might, they didn't have a problem with you until you tried to say somebody else was Lord. And so the, the emperor at the time dispelled the Jews from Rome. And so for about five years, the Christian Gentiles ran the church in Rome. And, and then after the uh, emperor died, the Jews began to come back into Rome. And so now what we have is a church consisting of uh, Christian Gentiles that had been running the church for about five years on their own. And then now here comes the Jew, Christian Jews still holding on to some of their traditions. So there's some... Some, some something, something going on up in there, up in there, right? So Paul is, is writing this letter, and, and he's laying out a, a foundation. He's, he's laying out a theology and, and doctrine about salvation. And basically what he's teaching is that we're all sinners, Jews and Gentiles alike. Christ died for everyone, Jews and Gentiles alike. And salvation is for everyone. And, and then he's also showing in this passage that we're going to look at is that as a body of believers, we are one body, united. And so let's get started and, and let's go to work. Christ. He does a body good. So what Paul does in this passage is he's using an analogy of a human body. And he's using it to show and to teach the church in Rome how to serve Christ and to serve one another. So I'm going to move down to verse 4 and read verse 4 and 8 to, to bring back our Remembrance. It says, for as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And I'm going to stop right there. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So he's using this analogy of a physical body to show how uh, the believers should become one in Christ. So this body, it represents Christ's body. It represents the church. So, call, so Paul uses the figure of a body to describe the relationship. He says in verse 5, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. God created the church to be a redemptive agent in the earth realm. And, and so he has a purpose for the church, and he places every member 
in the local body as he sees fit. Yeah, I bet you thought you just walked by here, huh? I bet you thought you just got a card. I bet you thought your friend just invited you here. God has a purpose for the church, and he places every member, that's you and I, in the local body as well as the global body as he sees fit. So, again, we look at our body. Well, let's just imagine our body, okay? Our physical body. I, I was thinking about that this morning, and I was like, now I can imagine Beyonce before the twins. That's how I imagine my body, before the twins. But anyway, that <laughs> I digress. So imagine your physical body. It has many parts. I Googled how many parts are in a, 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 a human body, but I was getting so many different answers, I decided not to, to, to quote that. But if you really, truly think about it, just on the outside, we have toes, legs, knees, elbows, hands, fingers, many parts. If we even go to the inside, we have our blood, blood cells, we have blood vessels, organs, all kinds of things. And, and, and they work together. They function together for the whole purpose of the whole body. If you're eating a, a, a meal, your hand is, is holding the fork and, and your nose is smelling the food and your tongue is tasting and your teeth are chewing and your throat is swallowing. And then the, the, the bile inside the body, it, it does something to, to put the, the vitamins and the nutrients in, in other parts of the body. And then, and then the, the part that the body doesn't need, it goes out in waste. So the body in the natural has many parts and it works together for one common good. So though we, many, are one body in Christ. And so verse 4, it says this, for, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function as you just heard. But he designs the body to work together. You know, if you've ever been sick and had to go to the doctor and he had to explain what's wrong, you begin to see the, how intricate our body is and how awesome God is. Christ does the body good. Yeah, he does the body good. He designs the body to work together. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So Paul is saying we are one body. We are in Christ. He's talking to the believers. The believers only because if you're not a believer, you're not part of the body of Christ. Amen. So the believers, the Jews and the Gentiles, and one of their fights was this thing about work versus faith. So Paul argues that a person does not have to do any work to be saved. Why? Because God has already done the work through Jesus Christ. He said the work that Jesus did, it wasn't for any specific group, but for everyone. Hence the analogy of the body. Salvation is for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Now, remember early I talked about Lord, and, and in Rome, if, if you didn't call Caesar Lord, you were, you were uh, committing a crime. So here Paul is teaching to the Romans. <laughs> if you declare with your mouth out loud that Jesus is Lord, he has all the authority, Jesus is Lord, and then not only that, believe in your heart, and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So the body of Christ is for the believer. As members of the body of Christ, we are assigned different gifts to press us to function as one fit body. So I forgot to change the screen to my first point, but we can go there now. We ain't too late. Amen. 
go to my first point. This is it. Members of the body of Christ should function together in service to the work of the Lord. Members of the body of Christ should function together in service for the work of the Lord. The body has many members, and the many members don't have the same function, but they work together. So what we just learned is that at the moment of salvation, or maybe we didn't learn, maybe I didn't say it, but I'm going to say it now. At the moment of salvation, we are given at least one spiritual gift. We're given at least one spiritual gift, and it's used to serve together in unity. So when Paul talks about the members, the parts of the body, that's you and I using our spiritual gift. A few years ago, and it's, it's coincidental or maybe it's not, I don't know, that this weekend is, is the jazz festival in Winter Park. Some years ago, I went to the jazz festival in Winter Park, my husband and I. Didn't get to see now one show. Why? Because I broke my ankle. So we had got to the place we rented, and the, the ladies and I were sitting outside in a hot tub for, for hours and hours. And when we got out, I slipped in a hole, and I broke my tib tibia and fibula. Had to have surgery. Had to have pins and a plate. And then I was required to be on bed rest because I could not put any weight on my ankle. Now imagine that, laying in the bed all the time, couldn't get out the bed, and if and when I did, I had to use a crutch. Now imagine trying to use a crutch with just one leg because I couldn't put this one down. In my mind, I wanted to, you know, to try to hold my balance. So, so it was difficult. It was a strain on me to try to get up, to even go to the restroom. And then I couldn't take a shower because I had to leave the leg wrapped up. So imagine trying to climb into the bathtub with one leg that you couldn't you do anything with or use it. It was debilitating. I felt like I was handicapped. Matter of fact, I had a handicapped sticker. I couldn't drive. I couldn't go in my basement. I couldn't hardly do anything but lay around. I was debilitated. Why? Because a part of my body was not functioning like it was created to. And so I was handicapped. And it was difficult. So when we think of the body of Christ or the church, if we are not all functioning together based on the part that God has called us to, then it's debilitating, it's straining, it's, we're handicapped, we're limping around trying to use a crutch, we're hopping around trying to make this thing work. When we look at TV and we see what's going on in the world, it makes you wonder, is the body handicapped? Members of the body of Christ should function together. If you're saved, you're a member. I'm a member of the body of Christ. So I broke my ankle and my body didn't function properly. So Paul, in this passage, he talks about gifts and he talks about grace and he talks about body and members, and, and it can get a little confusing. And I noticed that he opens a lot of his letters using the term grace. He always says, for by the grace given to me. He always acknowledges that the grace was given to him. He didn't earn it. He didn't choose it. But what I found, too, is that Sometimes when I think he should be using the word gifts, he's using the word grace. And sometimes when he's using the word grace, I'm thinking he should be using the word gift. So it could be very confusing. And in my studies, he's saying grace, but, but my studies was leading me to believe he was 
was talking about gifts. I was confused. So I did a word study. And for those of you that just was in my IBS class, I did a lexical analysis of the word grace and the word gifts. Here's what I found. Look at them. You can just look at them and see how similar they are. The word grace comes from the Greek word charis. Charis. The word gift comes from the Greek word charisma, where we get our word charisma. Charis. Let's look at grace. Paul talks about the grace that it was given to him. This word grace, caris, interesting. It means to rejoice. Part of its definition means to rejoice. I said, well, no wonder grandma and them, when you talk about grace, they get to shouting all over the church. Amen? Because it means rejoice. It means, and we all know this, favor, unmerited favor. It means, um, it means gratification. And so when we look at grace, caris, when we receive it by faith, grace transforms man. When we look at grace by faith, we see that grace causes man to love God. When we look at grace and, and we apply it by faith, we see that grace causes you and I to seek after the righteousness of God. When received by faith, this grace, it causes us to die daily unto our sins. When we, when we apply our faith and we receive our grace, then it, it causes us to live righteously. So when you hear somebody shouting or, or, or somebody jumping up and dancing or crying, it could be because of that grace, that grace that is unmerited, unearned, unsolicited, that saving grace. Somebody said that amazing grace. And they said, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And see, if it wasn't for that grace, I don't know where I would be. The song, another songwriter said, but for the grace, I don't know where I would be. But for the grace, I once was blind, but now I see. But for the grace of God, I didn't earn it. And neither did you. <laughs> and guess what? We don't even deserve it. But he gave it to us. He chose us. And he placed us in the body. Okay, so, but where does my gift come from? That same grace. That same grace. That word, Cadiz, ma. Cadiz is grace. Ma, it's the result of. So our gifts are the result of that amazing grace, that saving grace that we don't deserve. So your gift, my gift, we don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We can't work for it. God gave it to us. Yes, hallelujah. So the charisma, the gift, it, it, it's your ability. And guess what? It's bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit. And it's according to God's will to profit the body in the earth realm. In the earth realm. We are the body of Christ, believers. Hmm. This spiritual gift is not a thing. It's not a thing. It's a person. It's a person in the Holy Spirit. Remember I said we're saved by grace through faith. That grace is the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it says, Now to each one 
the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Acts 2 and 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it, it, he is the one that endows the gift upon us and works it through us. So as members of the body of Christ, we are assigned different gifts. And we're assigned different gifts to press us to function as one fit, healthy body. Christ does a body good. Christ does a body good. Christ, he does a body good. So we're assigned different gifts. Let's go to the third screen and look at verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. That God has assigned. God assigned it. I know you want to sing. <laughs> but did God assign it? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I know you want to stand before the body and preach a word like Pastor Felix. But did God assign it? God assigns the gifts. He distributes the gifts. He parcels out. He allots the gifts. I was doing a study on that word distribute a lot. And, and, you know, it was so interesting. It took me to Joshua. It took me to Joshua. And I was like, wow, this is, this is weird. So, and, and it was the word a lot. And then it started making a little sense. So if, if we remember, Joshua is the one that, that led the children of Israel into the promised land. Moses got them there, and then Joshua led them in there. But when they got in there, Remember, they still had to fight and blah, blah, blah. So they get into the land, and, and it's flowing with milk and honey just like God said it because God gave it to them. And then he allotted, he parceled, he distributed different parts of the land to the different tribes. Some may have gotten more than others. Some got this part and that part over there and way over there based on what God gave them. The Levites didn't even get any land. The Levites got God himself. They had to live in the temple where the presence of the Lord was. And so what your gift is that you have, God assigned it, allotted it, distributed it, handed it out. He gave it to you and to me. So, if God, it's God that assigns the gifts, as we just saw. Ephesians 4, it says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Back at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So members of the body of Christ should function together as the Lord determines. As the Lord determines. And I'm not trying to guilt nobody, but sitting in your seat ain't going to get it. Amen? It's just not. Last night when I was studying again, I was up late and just wrestling and just all these different things just happened to your body and your mind. And I was like, Lord, I don't know why you chose me for this. Because if it was my choice... I would be up at Winter Park chilling, I listening to some Charlie Wilson or whoever else is up there. I wouldn't, you know, sometimes I feel like that. It's like it's too much. But yeah, it is when I'm trying to do it in my own strength. God not only graces us with the gifts, but he empowers us with the Holy Spirit. So it's not about me at all. 
It's God. He, he gives it to us, and then he equips us, and then he works through us. He does all of that. Guess what? We don't have to do nothing. We don't have to do nothing. If we're doing something, that's why it's frustrating and hard. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, so, so here's what Paul said. I'm going to go back up to uh, what verse was that? Verse 6. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us. And, and uh, verse 1 and 2 of, of chapter 12 kind of lays the foundation because once we're, once we're saved, we are to surrender our bodies as living sacrifices unto God. And, and our bodies, our lives, it, it don't belong to us at that point. So he gives us the gift. So Paul says like this, if he, if he gives you the gift of prophecy, then allow the, the Holy Spirit to allow you to prophesy in proportion to your faith. If service, then serve, allowing the Holy Spirit to serve through you. If one teaches, allow the Holy Spirit to teach. If one exhorts, allow the Holy Spirit to exhort. If one gives or contributes, do it generously. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do through you. If one who leads, lead with zeal. If one who does acts of mercy, do it cheerfully. So if God makes you an eye, then allow the Holy Spirit to equip you to see. He will. If God makes you an ear, the Holy Spirit will equip you to hear. If God makes you a hand, the Holy Spirit will equip you to grab, to hold, to touch. Why? Because he does a body good. Yeah, he does a body good. Back in the 90s, there was a commercial. And the slogan was, milk does a body good. Y'all remember that? Milk does a body good. And it was designed to cause children to drink more milk. And, it, and, and so the commercials would show a little scrawny kid. And there was one I looked at, and he's standing next to this beautiful girl, and she ain't paying him no attention because he's this little scrawny kid. But in his mind, he's like, yeah, I'm going to drink my milk. Yeah, and I'm going to get big, and then you're going to be checking me out. So he's drinking his milk, and he's getting bigger and stronger. And then I looked at another commercial, and he's standing, the little scrawny kid is standing in between all these big, they look like bullies. He's like, yeah, I'm going to drink my milk, and I'm going to get bigger and stronger as if to say, I'm going to handle y'all. So he's drinking his milk, and he's getting bigger, and he's getting stronger. And so imagine the body of Christ. You know, I mentioned earlier, we watch TV and we see all this stuff going on, mass murders, um, laws being put into effect that are not of God, lies and, and, and all this stuff in the White House. It's so much mess. It's just, it's, it's discouraging to even watch TV. And, and then even to walk down the street, we can't go anywhere because there might be a mass shooting or, or anything. It, it, it can pop up anywhere. And so imagine the body of Christ to the world, what the body of Christ may look like to the world. That little scrawny kid. Let's be real. That little scrawny kid. But imagine this. Imagine the body of Christ standing up on our feet. Amen. The body of Christ standing up on our feet and then drinking, drinking and bathing in the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. And, and imagine the church standing up on his feet, drinking and bathing in the, the, the Holy Spirit and, and using our eyes to see where God is working. Imagine the body of Christ rising up, drinking in the Holy Spirit and using those feet and legs to join God where he's working. Imagine the body of Christ drinking of the Holy Spirit, standing on their feet, using their heart to love and to have compassion on the lost and the downtrodden. Imagine if the body of Christ would stand on his feet, drink and bathe in the Holy Spirit, and use his arms to hug on a dying and lost world. Imagine the body of Christ rising up, drinking in the Holy Spirit, getting stronger, bigger, taller, using their mouth to tell of a living Savior that is in the world today. Imagine the body of Christ rising up on our feet, coming together as one with all the members and all the parts. Oh, come on. Christ does a body good. The world would look at the body of Christ and would not see a little, small, scrawny kid. He would see, the world would see a big, strong, fit, healthy body of Christ moving and doing what, what God wants to do in the world. Christ, he does a body good. Come on, worship team. Christ, he does a body good. I said, Christ, he does a body good. Yeah, he does. If we let him, if we join him, if we, if we realize what it is that he's gifted us and empowered us to do. Now, I understand. My daughter said to me, Mom, some people don't even know what their spiritual gifts are. And that's real. That's real. That's real. Here's the first thing I would say to you is check your relationship go to the giver of the gift go to the giver of the gift that's the first thing I know sometimes though it's confusing because because God called me to preach and I was like who and I ran for a long time I wasn't sure I wasn't sure so I understand that's real, that's real. And so practically, we have this thing that's called the spiritual gift inventory. And so people of God, body of Christ, we have got to stand up and, 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 and join in, join our members together and be that strong, healthy body. And so I'm glad you asked about how to find out about your spiritual gifts. I'm glad you asked, because guess what? Restoration has a class on spiritual gifts. Minister Annette, raise your hand. She can, uh, if you're wondering, if you want to get involved, if, if you really want to know, because guess what? You have one. You have at least one. At least one. The moment you gave your life to Christ and he filled you with the Holy Spirit, you were given grace. So you have one, and we need to activate it and use it. And like uh, Pastor Derek preached for the last couple of weeks, get help. Don't stop being pimped. The body of Christ needs to stop being pimped and stand up strong. <laughs> Amen. So after service today, go out into the foyer, and, and, and um, I'm not sure if there's something on that uh, information desk or not. There's a sign-up sheet for the class. She can explain how it works. I don't know. I just know there is one. Amen. Christ, he does a body good. And so right now, I'm going to bring Pastor Kay up, and she'll open the invitation because we talked about a lot of stuff. We talked about salvation. So there might be somebody here that has not surrendered their life unto God. And if that's you, there's ministers up here to minister to you. If you just need prayer for whatever reason, there's ministers here. Amen.